Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. How glorious is your dwelling place, O blessed architect of the universe. My soul longs, yes, aches for the abode of the beloved. All that is within me sings for joy to the living heart of love, even as the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nesting place where its young are raised with your majestic creation, you invite us to dwell within your heart. I have no sense of having had a happy childhood or not. not I'm, and I'm realising saying that, it sounds like I'm about to say how awful my childhood was. But I basically, my, and I've discovered my sister as well, both of us have, don't really have a memory of, of, or a sense of our childhood from before we were seven. Um, so I, I don't know if, um, whether my childhood was happy or not. Um, I have photographs that indicate something, but I have no sense of, of the truth of that. But then what happened was when I was um, seven years old, I was, I was put in hospital for a year. Um, I was hospitalized for a year with rheumatic fever and scarlet fever. And within a year after coming out, I was then sent to boarding school. So I was sent away to boarding school um, at a very young age. And that, I, I, the way in which I was sent by my parents, I was told I was loved. This is for your own good. We love you. Now go. And I, I can, the only way I can make sense of that now is that that sort of created a, a feeling within me, a, a belief in me that there was something wrong with me because I couldn't make sense of it otherwise. They loved me, but they sent me out. They sent me off. And, and that sense of there being something wrong with me, which manifested in, in feelings of shame about who I was, has stayed with me for much of my life. And that feeling was reinforced by some of the choices that I made, some of the lifestyles I adopted, the, the drugs that I took for many years. Um, and being gay felt like that was part of that. Um, because in those days, it, it was still kind of not okay to be gay. And so that tied into that, that fed into that sense of shame about who I was. So I had this sense of like, not being okay with who I was, and I would be incredibly um, self-critical along the way. And that went on for years, um, and so that sense of shame and the sense of there being something wrong with me would be reinforced by some of those choices that I made, some of the, um, yeah, the things that I found myself doing. And then eventually on my life journey, um, I finally, um, things started to change for me, and I heard, started to hear about self-love. And, and I really found it hard to understand what that meant. Um, and I eventually was able to sort of start paying it lip service, if you, if you like. I, I could understand it as a sort of an actual intellectual idea, and so I would, I would start um, paying it lip service, service, but not really understanding what it meant. And I started hearing that we are made up of both good and bad. Um, that we all contain the sort of potential to, for, for good and for bad within us. And I, and I could certainly tell you all about the bad um, that was in me, but the good, no, that, wasn't, that was really difficult. That wasn't okay. If I started to tell you, try and if, even if I could identify the good, if I started to tell you about it, then there was something about, oh, that's not good because you're blowing your own trumpet, you're, um, you're big-headed. Um, those were the sort of messages that I feel that I would have got. And then finally, I mean, I'm talking about where this is a long kind of lifespan, if you like. Um, and then but within that, then I, I sort of, I find myself reminded of Marianne Williamson's words that, that will be familiar to you and that were quoted by Nelson Mandela in his famous speech. And Marianne Williamson writes, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light. It is our light not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine. As children do. 
We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. I, I loved those words the first time I heard them. Something in me shifted. I didn't, I still couldn't kind of get this idea that, um, that my light was, uh, that my light was okay and even that I possessed this light, that I had this light and that I was a child of God. The idea that I might be a child of God was such um, a remote thought because I was so awful, there was something wrong with me. How could that be, that be, that be true? But I man managed to sort of begin to develop an inter intellectual understanding of, us, of this sort of idea that, that we are both good and bad, but I couldn't accept it in my heart. I continued to be self-critical. And I was my, sort of informed by quotes like, it's easier to acknowledge the good that I do rather than the good that I am. That's one of the quotes I have written on my kitchen wall. And that's because I identify with that. That's very much about, you know, I tell you who, what I do as a way of sort of saying who I am. Um, and this is where I kind of earn kudos. Um, my ego is kind of defined. I am defined by what I do. And even in the wake of some terrible dreams, I had, a, a, I was away on retreat a few years ago, on a silent retreat, and I had the most horrendous, awful dream one night. Um, I dreamt that I was hurling excrement at God. Uh, and I woke the next day and I felt so ashamed for even being capable of containing and having that image. And the next night, I had another dream in which I was completely enfolded in light. And and I was um, uh, on this retreat. There was a spiritual director, and I spent some time with him. And, I, and my understanding from that was that, you know, that, okay, I can, okay, I can finally start to to accept that God might love me despite all my stuff. And he said, you know what? Maybe it's not despite it, but maybe it's because of it. And this was one of those kind of moments. Really, God might love me because of who I am. Oh. So even in the wake of those dreams, I was, it didn't counteract the shame that I carried about of who I, who I was. It, and it was like that until I, I read um, these words from Richard Rohr. And he wrote, We are sons and daughters of heaven and earth, both at the same time. Much of the work of enlightenment is to allow these two identities to coexist, just as Jesus did. For me, it is the core of Christian faith. We are sons and daughters of heaven and earth, both at the same time. That passage has profoundly influenced my relationship with God and with myself. Those words settled into my heart and another veil like, was lifted to reveal another truth. At last I can begin to accept the idea of being both light and dark, heaven and earth. And begin to recognise I am both my earthly self, that is my crankiness, my intolerance, my shortcomings, all those things that were the, the, the stuff, the fodder that fed my shame and my, my self-hatred. Uh, but I'm also my heavenly self, that self that experienced bursts of joy, has a relationship with a robin in my garden, which has recently changed, but that's another story. <laughs> the work that I do, my, the tenderness that I bring to my work, and the heartfelt and the internal responses that I experience to, in response to some of my experiences. I am both. I am not either or... I am both. And I realised that I'd always attached a judgement to the idea that one was good and the other was bad. One was human weakness, 
the other was some spiritual goodness. So I've now kind of begun to understand that actually my earthly self, self is not wrong and my heavenly self solely desirable and right. I understand that I am held in God's embrace as both. I have known this cerebrally for some time, but hearing it reflected in, in my spiritual director's response to me one day, I heard and saw it in, my, in myself for the first time, and now I know it. This was a powerful revelation. I am both. And now my challenge becomes how to live with these two aspects of myself. Because I aspire to live a life of... Uh, sorry, I aspire to live a grace-filled life, but I'm so often weighed down by my feet of clay, my earthbound humanness that I so readily chastise myself for having. My fears, my expectations, my anxieties, my defensiveness, each closing me to the potential for grace. So then, I learn I am a temple. I am a temple. I am a temple of spirit, solid, grounded in clay in the earth, with columns that stretch upwards and outwards, and how this contrasts, this idea that I might be this temple, how this contrasts with the image that I held for years of myself as a, as a barely discernible photograph, an underdeveloped photograph. This was how I, I managed to finally, when I was able to articulate how I felt about myself, how I saw myself, and this was the able that I was able to define it as the old-fashioned developing photographs when you used to sort of expose a, a sheet of photographic paper to some light, to a negative, and then it was placed in a bath of, of, of chemicals and it was developed. And in, it began as, a, as a, a blank white piece of paper and then gradually an image started to form and, and it carried on, but that when that beginning image, that was how I always felt about myself, insubstantial, not really defined, not really fully here, no clear definition of who I was. So this idea that I'm a temple of the spirit, this, this solid and grounded in the earth, feet of clay, but with these columns that aspire to this life of grace, is contrasted with this, this idea of the photograph. And because along with that photograph, I, was, I clearly was lost in a desert, and, and, and I kind of those years now for me were very much like my sleepwalking years. And um, yes, and that's how it was until these encounters with these kind of words, these literature, these readings helped I woke, helped me wake up, and I made that turn for home. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, it is written, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. So this um, month, the theme of the, of the messages for this month has been the Psalms. And um, the Psalms originally were intended to be sung. They were written as songs and would have been sung. And this, I'm saying this by way of connecting with this reading that I'd like to now read. Some words from Catherine Robbie, and this is called Heart Song. The song of your heart and the heart of your song is the essence of you. Your song is within you. The sound of your song is always echoed back to you. God sings your song to you all the time. That's how you recognize God's voice. You are not called to write or finish your song. It is already complete. You are called to live it, to sing it joyfully and to embrace it fully. Trust your harmony within. You know it. You have heard it before. You are drawn to its sound. 
Your heart song awakens you in the morning. It plays in your spirit as you rest. It calls you when you are restless. Dance with me and find peace. It carries you from your first breath to your last. One day it will leap forth to return to the heart of God. Your song is unique and you will never and will never be heard again. Learn to live it. Within you is your heart song. And the purpose is to sing your heart song. It is a melody of truth and wisdom, a symphony of strength. The heavenly choirs sang your song to you as you were birthed from the mind and heart of God into your mother's womb. Don't let the noise of this world drown it. Pay attention to it. Listen to it. Learn to sing it. It is the most beautiful sound you will ever know. How glorious is your dwelling place, O blessed architect of the universe. My soul longs, yes, aches for the abode of the beloved. All that is within me sings for joy in the living heart of love. Even as the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nesting place where its young are raised within your majestic creation, you invite us to dwell within your heart. O loving creator of the universe, Blessed are all who put their trust in you. They bless the world. May it be so. Amen. Amen.